Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, AO, North, AO Spine North America sponsored webinar on uh, lateral interbody fusion. Uh, what is the right answer and when is it trouble? Um, we've got a, a couple of really great panelists tonight. Uh, John France uh, from University of West Virginia uh, and Dominic Pelly, one of my partners at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, please, if you have questions, use the question and answer function uh, that you can see on the top of your screen. Um, we'll try and uh, we won't try and we won't interrupt the presenters, but we'll go through the questions uh, for at least some of the questions at the end of, of each of the talks. Um, we're going to start uh, with uh, Dominic talking and then John. Uh, and then I've got a few cases that we're going to go through that sort of bring, hopefully will bring out some of the nuances of, uh, of what we're going to be looking at. Um, yeah, bad picture of me, good picture of John, good picture of Dom. Um, we do, uh, John uh, has no uh, uh, financial relationships. I have a few that do not particularly uh, extend to, to this, uh, as does Dom. Just to remind everybody, AO is an independent nonprofit specialty society. Uh, we do not endorse or promote the use of any specific product or commercial entities. Um, we're not actually using any equipment in here, but certainly any um, implants that we show, they're all uh, FDA approved. Uh, and uh, if, if not, if there's any off-label indications, we will let you know. Um, please, uh, all of your microphones have been muted and your cameras are turned off. So all questions should go in through the uh, Q&A box. Um, I'll look through the questions as we go and present them to the faculties. Um, the chat box is something for us. So if you want to communicate with us as participants, please use the Q&A box. So um, I, I sort of took uh, moderator's prerogative here. I was originally asked to give this, uh, to do this webinar on anterior or on lateral uh, interbody fusions. Um, I want to do lateral and interlateral, anterolateral, because in my idea, they're slight variations on the same technique, but essentially they work pretty much in the same ways. Um, it's interesting as I look around, I, I see places where there's very little of this done and they're probably underutilizing the technology. I think there's other places where I think people overutilize the tech, this technology. And so I sort of wanted to look at, when I set this up, I wanted to look at where is this a good idea and where perhaps are, are we stretching indications and perhaps maybe should be looking at other options. So the learning objectives for this, I want to understand what pathologies lateral interbody fusions can address, lateral and anterolateral, see what the options are, particularly looking at um, anterior, anterolateral, perhaps high lordosis, when to go anterior only, when to go front and back, sort of look at, at where we can use this technology to improve our outcomes for our patients. But I think more than any other things, uh, I'd like to look at what are the limitations of this technology? When should we probably be looking at other ideas? Um, so roughly, um, we're going to have Dom speak first on basically that the lateral injured body is the answer to most of your problems. And then John's going to explain uh, where Dom is wrong. Um, and then we're going to do some case discussions to decide, um, sort of look at the nuances of, of how we want to do this. Uh, and then we will have a little time for question and answer. Um, the nine o'clock is an estimate. It's going to be somewhere between nine and 930. Um, and thank you. And uh, I hope this is all useful for you. So uh, again, thanks. Thanks, AO Spine. Uh, great organization. Very happy to be part of it. And uh, thank you, Doug, for having me here. Uh, my name is Don Pelly. Like I said, I'm uh, one of Doug's partners at the Cleveland Clinic. And he did train me uh, seven, eight years ago. Um, so anything I say that seems a little odd, it, it all came directly from him. Uh, so uh, disclosures, uh, I, I do do some uh, surgeon to surgeon education for this technique. Uh, I, I would say that's the only thing that's relevant other than that the disclosures are not. Um, so uh, this talk is sort of an amalgamation of a talk I gave on anterolateral fusions, uh, colloquially known as the OLIF, which is a trademark. I, I don't call it an OLIF. So anytime I, I talk anterolateral in this talk, uh, uh, it's for what most people call an OLIF um, and direct laterals. So uh, basically, you know, the anterolateral fusion, the direct lateral fusion, the, the uh, anterior fusion, the TLIF fusion, PLIF, um, is all the way for us to get into the intervertebral disc space. Why do we need to do that? Sometimes it's to restore foraminal height. Most of the time it's to have another fusion surface to try to get these patients to heal um, 
and, and perhaps restore some lower doses. And we do that uh, if we're gonna come anterior uh, uh, through the spine in one of typically three ways, either as you can see in the left-hand pane, we'll come right through the psoas and the lumbar plexus is there and we just gotta be careful to avoid that and come through the psoas musculature and attack the spine or, or get into the spine in a vertebral disc space laterally. Um, or we could come in an uh, anterior lateral trajectory where we uh, take advantage of the space between the uh, abdominal vasculature that overlies the mid portion of the spine and the psoas muscle. Or we can do an anterior fusion where we would split the vasculature and come directly in the front of the spine. Basically, uh, what these are, are all, all different sort of fancy mnemonics to say that we're going to get to the spine through the retroperitoneal space. Um, and that's what it is, just retroperitoneal access, access to the inner vertebral disc space. And so what we're gonna talk about in this talk is these two techniques here. Um, I did take out some of the technique itself slides. We can, I, I can go over some of that uh, if anybody wants to talk about it after, but uh, most of this is when I do it. So this is the trans psoas technique. You can see it just kind of splits the muscle and then you, you push the lumbar plexus with the psoas posteriorly, and then the rest of the psoas comes anteriorly, you're in the middle of the psoas, and then you access your disc space that way. Or you can do an anterior lateral where you're coming in obliquely, uh, and you come in between the vasculature and the psoas, and you sort of don't even get uh, close to the lumbar plexus to access the intervertebral disc space. And that would uh, be your corridor for anterior lateral fusion there with the vasculature uh, outlined in blue and the psoas muscle obviously outlined in red. So I'm gonna give just a two minute plug on anterior lateral surgery. So I do, I do a fair bit of lateral surgery in my practice. Um, probably, you know, I, I would say, you know, two or three a week out of, you know, roughly 10 cases a week. So not insignificant amount. 95% of them are anterior laterals. I'll, I'll do some trans psoas surgery uh, when the occasion calls for it. I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Orr said at the beginning uh, of the talk is that I, I don't think they're all that different of a surgery. Right, it just it's just a little bit your your angle of approach, but I am going to give a little plug for it because I do like the technique. I I think it's good direct visualization of the disc space when you when you manipulate the plane between the psoas and the vasculature. So I always teach the fellows that it's a minimally invasive incision, but it's an open surgery. Right, I'm looking at the disc. I can clear out the disc. I, I'm looking at everything I need to see. It's very reminiscent of doing like an ACDF in that way. The patient positioning is rather easy. You don't have to worry about the iliac crest as much uh, because you're coming in front a little bit. So if you have somebody that has the spine sort of deep seated into their pelvis, you can access four five and I do five ones at times uh, without having to worry about jackknifing the table and taping everything back and being real creative with patient positioning. You avoid the motor nerves. Um, the lumbar plexus, you're not in the middle of the psoas, so theoretically you shouldn't be close to the lumbar plexus. For me, I, I like this because I don't need to neuromonitor these patients, so having the psoas muscle relaxed I think is a little bit easier on the psoas muscle, and they get a little bit less problems with it postoperatively, and it just helps to have them completely relaxed like when you're doing an A-lift. Um, I don't ever access the ventroepidural space on purpose with these cases. Uh, so I would, I would take that out of there. I think if you need to, in my hands, at least, if you need to decompress something directly, if you need to get into the epidural space, I favor doing that posteriorly. Um, but I think it is a good streamlined uh, workflow. It's very ergonomic to come anterior lateral because you're in front, you're just kind of looking right down. You don't have to stand over the patient with them. For those of you that don't know me, I'm not very tall. So it's a little bit difficult to stand up and over when I could just look at it through the belly. But why laterals in general, as opposed to just posterior surgery? We're all comfortable with posterior surgery. We like posterior surgery. I like posterior surgery. So I even bothered learning this lateral technique and, 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 and uh, implementing it in our practices. I think this, I, I just kind of put this chart together as, as just a rough guide. I think the larger graph side is a good thing. You know, I think the bigger graph you have, the less risk you have of subsidence or some good data that the wider lateral cages you put in 22 millimeters and wider, you have less chance for that to subside. You increase your fusion rates because you have more fusion surface area, right? So I think you can get a much better graft in coming laterally than you can, than you can coming posteriorly. You don't need to get into the epidural space most of the time here. And so when you have no epidural work that you have to do, you lower your risk of neurological injury, you lower your risk of complications, derotomies, et cetera. Uh, that whole risk profile of getting in the epidural space sort of goes away. 
you avoid the muscle dissection in the back. Uh, we've all seen MRIs of patients that have had extensive posterior dissections and their paraspinal muscles don't look normal. I don't know if that clinically matters. I don't know if we studied if that clinically matters, but I can't imagine it's good to have fibrotic replacement of your paraspinals as opposed to uh, having normal musculature. I think a big one, at least in my practice, I do a lot of revision surgery. I work at a big tertiary care center is that, you know, I can retain the previous hardware if everything's fine with the fusion. So if I have somebody that's fused three to sacrum or three to pelvis or four or five or whatever the fusion is, and it's a nice solid fusion, screws are in the right spot. There's, there's no reason that I need to revise that as aside from maybe having to connect into posterior hardware that I'm going to place. If I go laterally, then I don't have to rip all that old hardware out. It's just a much, much, much smaller surgical footprint uh, for, for a problem. And then, you know, does it help with our adjacent segment disease? I think the jury's still out on that. I, I, I don't think the jury's out on the fact that if we restore segmental lordosis, that's better for patients in the long run, right? If we get them balanced, even for degen cases, if we pay attention to their, to their lumbar lordosis and try to match their uh, pelvic incidence and keep them in harmony, does that reduce the risk of adjacent segment disease? Not to mention you don't bugger up the adjacent segment facet joint either. And so those are kind of the things that I think about or what I thought about ahead of time before I decided to sort of implement this into my practice. And, and I think those are, are reasonably good talking points. So some questions I ask myself, is it, is, it, is it worth it, right? Should we go through all this? And there's been some data, just kind of anecdotal, you know, single physician studies on, on learning curves. And it has a rather steep learning curve, means you, means you learn it quickly, right? I don't, I don't think the learning curve is very difficult. I think what happens is a lot of people will do direct lateral surgery and then they'll transition to ATP surgery. And so I think all in all, it's, it's once you get the hang of it, you can kind of rock and roll with it uh, and sort of push the, uh, what you can do with it over time. And that's kind of what this study shows is that this is surgeon who looked at his first 25 cases and the subsequent 25 cases. He didn't notice any real difference in his complication, right? But like most things, he just got a little bit faster with surgery and a little bit less x-rays that he was taking. The next thing is, does it does it do what we need it to do, right? Um, that's with new technology is great, but if it doesn't do the job that it needs to do, and then there's no point in using it. And so um, I'll just present some quick studies on this. This is they, great fusion rates, um, as you would expect. So um, high 90s for for most levels. I mean, this paper reported 100% fusion rate at L5S1, which it makes me question it a little bit, but. Um, but you know, good, good, solid fusion rates in the high 90s for these. And then what about when we fuse more levels? It's, it doesn't decrease, right? So even up to five levels fused here, uh, this, they had a 96% fusion rate. So single level, double level surgery, uh, two level surgery, you can, you can sort of expect these patients to fuse and, and not have to worry about pseudoarthrosis all that much. Now it's a little confounded, right? Because most of us use biologics in our indirect surgery where we're not harvesting bone graft and, and that might make a difference. But nonetheless, I think you can tell patients that they're going to have some pretty darn good fusion rates for these. And that's what we need the spine to do. When we look at complications, I mean, it's kind of obvious stuff, subsidence. Um, when you compare it to uh, ALIF, you know, post-op ileus is, uh, is important in both groups. Vascular injury is obviously more common in an ALIF than it is in a direct lateral, but reasonable complication rates. So, you know, for question number two, you know, does it do what we needed to do? I think we, I think it fuses the spine and I think it fuses the spine with acceptable complications rates. So I think, I think it's a good approach from that standpoint. And, but we already have something, right? You know, I, I get in this argument all the time with people that want uh, disc replacement surgery and I'm not, it's not the point of this talk, but we have something that works really, really good, right? And ACDF, I think works really, really good. So T-lifts work really, really good. We know they're a good surgery. So if it's no different than a T-lift, why, why do it, right? And so um, I, I attempted to look at this a little bit here and you can see first couple of papers are just comparing it to an A-lift at, at 5.1. When you do it at 5.1, there's less blood loss when you do it laterally. Um, there is a lower operative time when you do it laterally. When you look at the th important things, you know, change in segmental lordosis uh, between an ALIF and an anterior lateral surgery is, is roughly about the same. So I usually use ALIFs in my practice for deformities because I think I'm going to get some big, nice lordotic cages. And well, well, the truth is, at least the data would suggest that you can get nice lordotic angles by doing lateral surgery as well, uh, especially if you take the, uh, the ALL down. So I think the opportunity to restore lordosis um, a lateral approach is very powerful and perhaps just as powerful as an ALIF if done correctly. 
Uh, these are some busy slides, but I think they're on the important side. So if we look at an A-lift versus lateral and segmental lordosis, you can see that there's really no uh, statistical significantly uh, diff statistical significant difference between the two. But if you look at it compared to a T-lift or compared to posterior lateral fusion, you can see that both A-lifts and, and lateral fusions are better at restoring uh, segmental lordosis and overall lumbar lordosis, which I think all of us would agree that uh, lumbar lordosis is a rather important thing to pay attention to. When we look at things like foraminal height, T-lifts do great with foraminal height. So do uh, lateral surgeries, A-lift surgeries. They're all much better than posterior lateral surgeries. Um, and then change in disc height is obviously the best with an A-lift because you just can just put a taller graft in because you have better access that way. So a couple of uh, some indications. Um, so when do I use the surgery? Why do I think it is the best thing since sliced bread? Um, and I'll go over some of that. So. Uh, I love this surgery for adjacent segment uh, disease. So you got this patient of mine. Uh, I did T-lift on uh, solid uh, fusion, uh, no issues with the T-lift. The T-lift doesn't need to be revised. The screws aren't loose. There's, uh, there's bone through the cage, uh, but they have two level adjacent segment disease. And so we have an option of opening things back up and you can see they've been decompressed at, at the levels above also by the lack of spinal processes on the x-rays. So we can open everything up, we can rip everything out, we can replace everything, extend up, revise the decompression, um, so on and so forth. Or, or we can just uh, use some retroperitoneal access and, and do a surgery and, and get what they need to do by doing the lateral approach there. So I think it's a great option for adjacent segment disease. So before, you know, again, we used to we used to have to explore everything, explore the fusion, remove the hardware, extend the fusion cranially, decompress, uh, the spine again, and you know, that could be normal decompression, that could be decompression in scar tissue, that could be facetectomy. Perhaps you want to put an inner body in uh, because they've already had an attempted at effusion at that level. Um, and everything, every one of those points is an opportunity for something to go wrong. And not to say that something can't go wrong during anterolateral surgery, but if there's less steps that you have to do, there's probably less opportunity for error. And so I think, um, I think it's a really powerful tool for adjacent segment disease. Non-unions, it's a great operation for non-union in my opinion. So people that have had posterior lateral fusions that are ununited or they've had um, T-lifts that have went on to pseudoarthrosis, this is a great powerful surgery for that. Um, T-lift cages you can remove from the lateral position just like you can remove them from the A-lift position. Um, so I've taken plenty of T-lift cages that are non-united out, um, uh, plenty of posterior lateral fusions that did not heal. And it's a great surgery for patients because they just got you know, they've had this big lumbar surgery, this big dissection, they're not healed and they don't want to go through another surgery. And you give them a really nice option where they could have a small incision, you know, kind of a, you know, an inch and a half, two inches long and, uh, and kind of accomplish what needs to be accomplished pretty well with a really, really excellent fusion rates. So here's a patient of mine, uh, a pretty recent patient of mine uh, that has this old hardware. Now, now I'm lucky because I, I practice with, uh, with the great Dr. Orr here who can walk into my OR and tell me exactly what hardware that is and when it was put in and the year it was manufactured and how to get it out and which tools to use. And I, I'm, I've taken advantage of that many times in my career, um, but it's still not easy, right? And it's a, sometimes these old hardware systems are proprietary and it's a little bit of a pain. So this lady, you have to take my word for it. I didn't put the CT in here, but she has a pseudoarthrosis at three, four. She's solidly fused at four five. And she's got, as you can see here, adjacent segment disease at the level above with stenosis, pretty significant stenosis, fluid in her facet. So she needs a two-level fusion and extension up. And we can, again, take all that stuff out, um, or we can just do a two-level lateral surgery. So for her, I did uh, uh, just a straight cage um, through the pseudoarthrosis. I didn't think it needed integrated fixation. And then I did an integrated fixation cage uh, at the level above, treating both her problems with a relatively small surgical footprint. Uh, this is a big one I think doesn't get enough attention when we talk about lateral surgeries. Previous decompressions that still have neurological issues, right? So somebody that's been decompressed at multiple levels or even a single level, um, the decompression might have been good, it might have been a little suboptimal, but either they've gone on to have an instability such as spinal thesis or rotatory subluxation, or they've had some disc space collapse since their decompression. Now they have foraminal stenosis, lateral recess stenosis. These patients that, that you know, it's kind of a risk to go back in and get them completely decompressed posteriorly. Can you, can you do this with a better option? I, this is probably where I use this approach the most. So Here's a patient, it's about two and a half years out. He had a multi-level lumbar lamb elsewhere. Uh, and you can see he's got a slip at four or five. 
He's decompressed from two to five. He's got bad stenosis at the top level uh, with his facets uh, uh, kind of uh, caving in on him. At the next level down, you can see that the dura is kind of mushroomed out through a pretty, pretty limited laminectomy, uh, narrow laminectomy, uh, and uh, pretty bad stenosis at that level. And the level where his spondylolithesis is, you can see he's got bad uh, lateral recess stenosis uh, there as well, as well as central stenosis. So here's a guy that's been decompressed uh, at multiple levels. He's got terrible radiculopathy, terrible claudication. You can go back in and you, if you're gonna fuse them, you know, it's, you're gonna do T-lifts, you're gonna do three level T-lift, try to get some foraminal height back through previous scar. And, and maybe people are super, super talented, but I look at something like this here and I think that's a that's 100% derotomy there are not that they're out of music in the world, but they're, they're no fun if you can avoid them either. And so I think there's better options for these patients nowadays. And, uh, and here's a CT scan. You could see even in him, he had some bony stenosis and we'll go through that a little bit at the end, but he had some bony stenosis there. And I still thought that it was best to try to treat him uh, through an anterior lateral approach. And so we ended up doing a three level um, ATP surgery uh, and he's about two and a half years out doing just fine. Uh, and did not need any sort of revision of his posterior decompression. Uh, he had complete resolution of his leg pain, uh, which was good. And so he's, he's doing great. Central and foraminal stenosis. So, you know, don't forget that this is not just for revision. It's sort of a lot of revision. Well, I, I do a lot of revision surgery, um, a lot of revision surgery, but I think for standard degen cases, you know, quote unquote standard cases, this is a powerful tool too. I will say now, and I'll say it again at the end, as much as my task here was telling you that lateral fusions are the best thing that's ever been done in the spine since the pedicle screw, uh, you know, don't fit uh, your patient, every patient to your technique, right? Don't be like a technique based surgeon, right? I don't, I don't try to look at a patient, and see how can I do a lateral surgery in them? I think you need to choose what's best in each patient. But I do think that even even in your standard cases, you don't have to knee jerk to just what everybody else does. You can do lateral surgeries there. So here's a patient of mine that has a, a pretty gnarly 3-4 rotatory subluxation. It's gonna to start to get some degen scoli from that 3-4 eventually, um, but just has basically single level disease. I think the rest of his spine looks fine. You can see his MRI here, he's got left leg pain. He's got reason to, because he's got some pretty bad lateral recess and foraminal stenosis on that left hand side from this rotatory subluxation. And so um, I think doing a T-lift in this guy makes all the sense in the world. I, there's nothing wrong with doing a T-lift in this guy, but I, I also think there's nothing wrong with doing a lateral surgery in him. And so we did this laterally single position um, and, and I thought it treated him quite effectively. It restored his foraminal height. Uh, we got good segmental lordosis at this level. And I think it's a great option in this patient. Here's one that might be a bit on the controversial side. So here's a 76 year old, uh, 76 year old male patient. It's got two level spondylolithesis, never been operated on before. Um, pretty significant at four or five, little spondy at three, four. But he's got some really, really bad stenosis, right? So he's got critical stenosis at three, four, critical stenosis at four, five. And, you know, he's um, a little bit of a sick guy, but, you know, when I look at this, he's got very mechanical type pain, meaning he sits down and all his pain goes away. He stands up, all his pain comes back, right? He, he can find a position of comfort where that comfort means a resolution of his leg pain. And he's got fairly collapsed this, especially where stenosis is the worst at three, four. So I look at this and I say, that doesn't look bony. It looks like ligament hypertrophy. I don't see a lot of you know ossification uh, in, in, uh, as, as you can see in the MRI. And his disc space is collapsed, so I probably can get a lot of height here. And if I get a lot of height, you know, maybe that'll stretch him out enough. And so when I have patients like this, I think a lateral approach, and again, I do ATP surgery, but I think any sort of lateral approach is a reasonable option if you say, hey, I'm gonna try this. If you still have claudication, if you still have leg pain after, we can go back in and decompress you. Let's walk you around the hospital for a little bit after surgery and see how things are going. And, um, and so we did two levels in him, um, single position, and he did fine. Um, and I, I would say that I don't do this too often when the stenosis is that bad. A lot of times I'll just decompress it because I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. But I do think it is a reasonable, reasonable thing if you have a patient that, you know, you don't want to put on the table for a long time and you don't want to do a two-level T-lift and, um, and you want to kind of have a smaller surgical footprint for whatever reason, I think that's a really good option. And then you're just kind of standard four or five, uh, kind of blow through this one um, is, uh, is very treatable here also. 
deformity. So I, I like deformity surgery. I do a fair bit of it, kind of a lot of it. I, I like doing it. I, I don't do laterals for deformity. So this slide is in here to demonstrate that this, I think patient has some, this is not my patient, but I think this patient has some degenerative scoliosis. They don't necessarily have a spinal deformity. I think doing minimally invasive spinal deformity work is, is I, I don't see the role of that. You know, I see it I see it for somebody that has some h symmetric collapse, maybe some rotary subluxation is, may progress onto a significant deformity. Laterals may be a good option there, or anterolateral surgery may be a good option there, but somebody that's significantly out of balance, at least in my hands, I'll be honest, I don't tend to use lateral surgery for those patients. So if you don't do a lot of this and um, you're sort of interested in doing a lot of this, I just have some thoughts on you know, how, to, how to get started. I would say that for your first couple of cases, you're, if you're not used to being in the retroperitoneal space, have an access surgeon um, with you there. I, I do my own approaches for these, but my first two or three cases, I had an access surgeon with me. Consider using navigation if you'd like. Uh, I think it can be quite helpful. Uh, cherry pick your first couple of cases. So um, I think that's really important to, to cherry pick when you're starting a new technique. Don't, don't pick the hardest case to do and use it as your first case. And here's something um, that when you, uh, my task here is to say laterals are great. I would say laterals are probably the best surgery for obese patients, right? Let me rephrase. Laterals are the easiest surgery on us for obese patients because they're, you put them in that lateral position and all their obesity kind of falls naturally forward, but they also are obese, right? So they have a lot of fat in the retroperitoneal space. So accessing the retroperitoneal space is, is really easy, right? Once you get through the abdominal musculature, you get past transversalis fascia, all of a sudden, boom, you're right there, right in the retroperitoneal space and it's full of fat. So it's a big space. I would caution you, do not do this for your first couple of cases in the really tiny, you know, 90 pound ladies, okay? They don't have any fat in the retroperitoneal space. And before you know it, you're right in the middle of the peritoneum and, and that can happen. It's okay, just repair it, right? don't hit the ball and repair it, but I would say that I get more nervous doing this in a really tiny person than I do doing it in a big person. This is a great, great, great surgery for obese people when they are good surgical candidates, which is a different talk unto itself. Um, where do, else, do I sort of uh, get a little bit scaredy caddish? Uh, they've had a bunch of abdominal surgery, lap coles I don't care about, um, colectomies on the other side I don't care about, um, but um, if they've had, you know, if their if their belly looks like a roadmap, um, I tend to try to avoid going in going in through the belly. And if they don't have the right anatomy for it, don't do it. When am I just careful? I think with any instrumented surgery osteoporosis, you got to think about subsidence. Diverticulitis can be a little bit tricky. So even in transoas uh, surgery, I so I did a case not long ago where the entire peritoneal sac was sort of stuck down onto the psoas. And I had to dissect that up off the psoas through the whole case. And so if I was doing a trans psoas surgery, I probably would have went through it. And so anybody that has a lot of inflammatory bowel disease that's significant, I think you should really be careful about being in the retroperitoneal space. Um, look at your vessels, look at your anatomy, look at your iliac crust, look at all the different things that you need to look at before surgery. Granted, this is not supposed to be a technique talk, but um, make sure that you can get there, right? The last thing you want to do is prep somebody for surgery and, and then realize halfway through the case that you can't even access the disc space for one reason or another. And then treating spinal stenosis, again, if, it's, if the stenosis is bony, right? So if the, if the ligamentum flavum is calcified, you're not gonna get much indirect stretch, right? Even if you put a big cage in there, it may not work as well. So people that have bony stenosis, I really sort of go back to just standard open procedures for these patients. And if, they're, if their symptoms are all the time, I worry about indirect decompression. I don't know if that's just a sort of, um, you know, uh, a barometer for the fact that maybe there's, they don't need a lot if they have mechanical symptoms. If they sit down and all their pain goes away and they stand up and all their pain comes back, Perhaps they just need a little bit of indirect decompression, a little bit of stability, and then, and then you treat them effectively. So if they have that, those symptoms, I tend to be very aggressive with indicating them for a uh, indirect decompression. This shouldn't be your first anterior uh, to the psoas surgery. This shouldn't be your first lateral surgery. Uh, this should be a posterior surgery. So be careful with these Mickey Mouse psoas ears and close vasculature. This is not gonna be a good day uh, for you to try to get there uh, through the side. This should be your first case, right? This, you could drive a train uh, into the spine from any direction you want. So this is the, the first case that you should do. 
And this real quickly, four, five, and five, one, why I think this is a great option because it's so easy to get to four, five. You could get to five, one, two, if the basketures. Okay, this is a patient of mine that I probably should have done an open posterior surgery on, but um, had this, you know, vein coming across and the psoas here. This is, you know, this is my most dangerous case. It's not the five, one cases. I cherry pick five, one cases that where the vasculature looks like it's on different sides of the earth. Um, but this one, the vascular are so close, I would be very careful in these cases, but um, that cage had to go in obliquely just to, just to keep his uh, uh, vein out of the way. 5-1 is accessible. Um, I won't go over the technique too much. I think I'm getting kind of there on time, but it, it's essentially an A-lift through the lateral position if you want to get to 5-1 uh, and, and you just put them laterally. The advantage of doing that is I think it, what it does is it allows their peritoneum to just naturally come down instead of like really pushing it over the side to get a little bit less ileus um, and a little bit less abdominal complaints after surgery. Uh, and that's what you're looking at. And you can do it through a, a single position. So if you're trying to save some time, you need to perk screws. It's a patient of mine I did a couple of years ago with a five bone ismic body and pyramal stenosis that was treated um, with, a, uh, with a lateral surgery. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I, think, I think lateral approaches are great. I think they're a powerful tool. I think it's very reasonable to get trained on them and to start doing them. Again, I, I, I really caution you, don't, don't be a surgeon that says, I only do laterals. I only do single position. I only do T-lifts, right? I, I mean, try to learn everything and, and do what's best for each individual patient. You should just have a variety of techniques at your disposal. But I think this is a really, really good technique to have. And I think it's a reasonable one to learn. And I, I, would, I would say that I would encourage you to do so. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. And I thank you for uh, listening to me uh, talk about one of my favorite surgeries. Okay. Thank you very much, Dom. Great talk. Um, we don't currently have any questions in the Q&A uh, queue, so uh, I think we'll move right on to, uh, to John. Um, again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A queue. Um, we'll, we'll do a little bit, uh, do a few questions uh, if there are any before we go into the cases, and then, of course, we'll allow you to, to ask some questions during the cases. So, um, John France is... Uh, somebody that I've known for longer than either of us care to admit. Um, he's a professor of orthopedic and neurosurgery at West Virginia University. And the thing I've always loved about John is he's always really good at getting to the, to the, uh, the gist of the matter and uh, is really good at calling a spade a spade. And that's part of the reason I picked uh, John to give this talk on what are the limitations of lateral interbody fusion. John, go ahead. All right. Hey. So... I'm going to give a little bit. That was that was a great talk with with good detail, and I think you know I think uh, Dom hit on a lot of really 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 important things about lateral inner body fusion, and and I'm probably going to reiterate some of those same things. Uh, probably just as a simple disclosure, I'm not an anti lateral inner body guy, and I use a fair number of lateral inner bodies. I do agree with with Dom's last comment wholeheartedly that. The more tools that you have in your toolbox, the better off you're going to be. And you, it's okay to have your favorite tool and you can make it work in most circumstances, but there's going to be times when you're going to say, well, my tool is not the greatest here, but I do know of this other tool that it's almost perfect for this. And so you, you want to be facile in a variety of things. You, you don't want to be stuck in one thing. This is how I do it. I couldn't re agree more. So the more, things you can do, the better off you're going to be and, 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 and use them where, where it's appropriately. And so I think there are limits to lateral inner body. The other thing that I would sort of bring up here is, and, and Doug remembers this, I, I'm always interested in seeing these approach and channels and what these things are named. Uh, I'm not sure what an OLIF is. I always thought that was an anterior lumbar antibody fusion. You know, we, we spent years taking down the diaphragm and approaching the spine where we could get from about T10 or T9 all the way to L5S1 with a little bumped up lateral. And so I think these are all variations of the same and what we name them. I mean, I've always done my lateral inner bodies anterior to the psoas. It never made sense to me to go through the psoas, put the nerves at risk when since the beginning of anterior surgery, we've been pulling the psoas back and going at it anteriorly. And you can take a direct lateral approach, just pull the psoas back. I think it is harder to do that when you get down to four or five in, a, in somebody with a large psoas muscle. So, you know, whether you come in slightly oblique or anterior, 
were straight lateral, it's sort of the same. Many of the things about the surgeries are, are really the same. And, you know, Doug and I did so many open procedures that I find it interesting when we do these limited, limited procedures, it's, it's really just a mini part of what we did for many, many years. There's nothing new about any of this. Um, and I find it interesting how it's almost, uh, I'm not sure what an OLIF is. I always thought an OLIF is what we did for years. Am I correct, Doug? I, I've always just called it an anterolateral. And yeah, yeah, that's what I always called it. It's just how much you want to move. If you don't want to move right. the vessels, it's an anterolateral. If you want to move the vessels, it's an A-lift. Yeah, so I think it is important that when you look at those corridors to understand what corridor you're in, particularly at four or five. Because if you're going to sneak around the front of four or five, you better take down the iliolumbar vein. I think if you're trying to sneak in with little motion through an anterior oblique corridor, you can get in there without taking down the iliolumbar vein. But when you're at four or five doing these procedures, you better be aware and understand that anatomy because an avulsed iliolumbar vein is a nightmare. It's big around as a pencil, it's short, and it's very hard to control once you've avulsed it. So some of that being said, I'm going to give a, a pretty, you know, high view here. Um, you know, I think there, there are indications. Uh, there, there are indications for surgery, but I think because we have a lateral inner body fusion, the indications for surgery haven't changed. You know, I, I see people doing surgery on things that I probably would never operate on because they're going to do a lateral inner body. Well, lateral inner body is just a means of fusion. And I think Dom outlined this pretty nicely. It's a means of fusion. That's all it is, is a technique. Indications for surgery have not changed. They're the same. And the lateral inner body uh, can be ideal for certain things. And remember, anterior fusions have been around a long, long time. So, you know, I, I think the lateral inner body has some really good uses. I think it's ideal locations are mid to upper lumbar spine. It's, it's almost the perfect tool when you're trying to go anterior at three, four, two, three. It's so simple to do. When you get to one, two, things get a little tougher and you, you have to feel comfortable maybe taking out the 12th rib. Uh, when you get down to four or five, it becomes a little more challenging. We will look at a little bit of that anatomy, but it, it's doable. At 5-1, I think what Dom showed is, is an A-lift just with the patient in a lateral position. Um, so I, I don't think of that quite as a lateral inner body. I think of that coming in a little straighter. So, you know, I think it has a lot of use in the mid to upper lumbar spine, and I like it as a tool there. I think when you're doing adjacent segment disease in the mid lumbar spine, particularly someone who you need to catch up on lordosis, because quite often those patients present to you with not white enough lordosis and you're trying to catch up a little bit and so at three four rather than a 17 degree graph you may be putting a 15 or 16 degree graph at that level to catch up a little bit on lordosis and i'll show you a slide in a little bit i think you have to be careful of that concept if you try to build too much lordosis in the upper lumbar spine where it's not supposed to be it's a great tool to correct coronal planes i mean if i'm you know, correct, correcting the coronal plane in an adult is not that important as long as they're balanced, but quite often when you're correcting them, you're also trying to treat stenosis, you're trying to indirectly decompress for amen, uh, and you do want kind of a nice balanced spine, and, and correction in the coronal plane, you can easily do three lateral inner bodies from one small approach if you work through the concavity. So, you know, I, I like it for that purpose when I feel like I need to correct the coronal plane. I, I think it's better than some of the other tools we have. I think it can aid sagittal plane correction, but I would caution you about its use in sagittal plane correction. I think it can be done. I think it can be done well. I'll show you cases where it wasn't done well and where it can be done well. I think you have to be cognizant of what it can and can't do. Some of it depends on how anterior. I think Dom showed some cases where he had his graft nicely in the anterior half of the disc. He used, a, a, you know, I don't know what degree they were, but it's a higher degree, somewhere 10, 15 degrees. And keeping it up there, he's able to get nice lordosis. Seven degree grafts in the middle of the disc. The, the fulcrum of rotation is too posterior. And I think you can, you can end up with a, creating flat backs. Indirect foraminal decompression seems almost the ideal 
procedure for this. I mean, I, I, I actually love it when I'm trying to open a frame and indirectly uh, from asymmetric collapse. And you know, decompression of the central canal and moderate stenosis with a lysthesis. I, I'll, I'll show you, you know, obviously Juan Uribe has been a champion of this, a paper that several of them wrote trying to maybe say, you know, where central stenosis is favorable for this and where it is. And I'm like Dom, I'm still a little leery of the use of a lateral inner body as an indirect decompression tool for central stenosis. But uh, I'm actually getting ready to do one coming up because my fellow's convinced that it's the way to go. And I think it's a, a patient that's probably favorable. So where is it troublesome? I, I think, you know, at four, five and five, one, I don't think it's an ideal tool. I think it's hard to come straight lateral. I think if you stretch and say, well, I'm coming in anterior lateral, which is, I guess, an oblique, uh, you can do that at four or five. You can do an A lift at five one from the lateral position. You know, there's no reason you can't do that. I always find it a little more disorienting. So I'd, I'd prefer to be supine, but there's no reason you can't do that. But it's still an anterior approach. You're still, in most circumstances, taking down the AOL or part of the AOL. I think if you have severe bony stenosis, uh, I think you're very hard pressed to think that that's going to indirectly decompress central stenosis if it, if it involves a lot of facet hypertrophy. It doesn't do that. I think it can correct a lysthesis. I think it could unfold folded ligamentum flavum, but I think it's, it's not going to correct bony facet hypertrophy. I think sagittal correction, you have to be careful about it. And I think Dom made a tremendous point. Uh, it is easier in a fat patient. There is no question it's safer. I think the really fat, like West Virginia fat, Dom, I'm not sure it's, it's a fun procedure. I mean, when, you know, we can get some really big ones. It's a deep hole and that fat is, is folding in everywhere around you and hard to see. But a nice chubby patient's your ideal patient because the fat protects you. I've seen thin patients. I 100% agree with Tom. If I'm doing a lateral inner body, I want to see. It's a minimally invasive, but I want to see. This isn't a blind procedure for me. In a thin patient, when we've been doing them, I've seen the retro per the peritoneal contents with the bowel and peritoneum continually slide around my retractor into my space. If you're not watching for that, you're going to go right through a loop of bowel. Thin patients are dangerous for this procedure. So be careful, you can do them, you just have to know. The, the mass of obese, um, my patients, you know, sometimes that's a little tough, but I think a little bit of chubbiness is, is ideal. Uh-oh, what happened here? Oh, there we go. So I, I think pre-op planning, and, and again, I don't wanna reiterate too much. Dom did a great job with all this. Um, you really wanna look at the crest, you wanna know where you're going. Can I really do a lateral inner body? Four or five is amenable to lateral inner bodies. I think if you sneak around the front, more like an oblique in like halfway between a straight direct lateral and a true A lift. Um, usually if I'm in that situation, I'm just on an A lift. I, I just don't find it that much harder. And I, I find it, it's, it's an easier corrective tool. And I can also do that through a minimally invasive incision. But, you know, some crests are not amenable if it's deep seated. Some people have a very low, long 11th or 12th rib and the upper lumbar spine is, is, can be challenging. I no longer put a bump or do anything to, to, to tilt them laterally to open it up. I, I just found it's not necessary. I just put them straight out on a flat jacks and I don't put anything to, to fold them. I don't know if Dom does. I don't think he mentioned that, but I don't do that. But I find even in these low ribs, I can can get in there, but it can be unfavorable. I think one of the nice things and one of the big differences for me uh, relative to T-lift is surface area and risk of subsidence. I think, you know, if, if you're going to use a T-lift for its corrective ability, um, you have to be aware that you have a small footprint and the risk of subsidence, losing any corrective ability you got is is can be pretty high, particularly in the older patients. And they, you still can get them to fuse, but you've lost your correction. I think if you're gonna, if you're in that situation, a lateral inner body is more protective because you can go ring apophysis to ring apophysis. However, I will tell you, they can subside. 
Okay, so particularly if you're get greedy. And I, in my OR, I have one of my scrubs. He's my greedy control man. Okay, I'm greedy. Like I like to get the height up nice and I like to get him saying, please tell me if I'm greedy. And he usually tells me and then I usually go up another size, unfortunately, because <laughs> I just can't help it. Um, and so when that happens, you crack the end plate. You don't realize it. And if you make a dent in the end plate, you can see these look pretty good. Um, you know, particularly if you pay attention to four or five, it's a little bit of an oblique view there, but I think we have it. I think we're pretty good end plate to end plate. We could have maybe gone a hair wider, but they're not bad. But, you know, here's a standing film at six weeks and you can see that bottom one subsiding. And I suspect we cracked that end plate probably when we put it in, allowing it to subside. So it, it is not foolproof for, to prevent subsidence. I, I love a -list. I think they're a great tool. I think when you're down at four, five and five, one, and you want corrective power and you want something that's gonna work with low subsidence rates, the a -list is your tool. I, I start a lot of my deformity surgeries. If they don't have 60 to 70% of their lordosis at four, five and five, one, I'm gonna reestablish that with a -list. A 5-1 A-lift, I 100% agree with Don. It's a slam dunk. Every so often, the anatomy is unfavorable. We're stuck, but that's not hard. 4-5 is a tough A-lift. You know, I love doing A-lifts even at 4-5, but it's a tough A-lift. If you're going to get the vessels retracted across the midline, you better get the iliolumbar vein down and go slow. And if you're having a tough time, do an oblique or anterior lateral insertion of the device. There's no harm done. The A-lift, you can access through very small incisions. Uh, I'm not a hyperlordotic cage guy, but I use a lot of 15, 16 degree grafts, depending on what company I use. You should have 15, 16 degrees of lordosis at four, five and five one. So generally that's what I'm using. If you look at this patient, you can see, this is kind of a flat back deformity. You can see how vertical the pelvis is, but, but this patient has essentially lost lordosis from four to the sacrum. That, that's where the problem lies. There's not much above it. You can see there's a little bit of a dent. So you do have to worry doing an A-lift that you know, your graft may sink into that. You're gonna have to try to get it to span that defect at the bottom of four. Uh, but you can see supine, the discs are still mobile. So you can put A-lifts in and, and without doing anything, you know, you can open up and reestablish all of your doses. And if you want to go to the back and, and lock it in and, and achieve more above, you can do that. I would postulate we have too much lordosis in the upper lumbar spine. We got too greedy. Uh, we should have just mostly kept the lumbar, but you can see what you can get. So in deformity at 4551, where the overall lordosis is, I, I really still feel like an A-lift is, is your best go-to tool. Uh, and you can do that through an MIS incision. I mean, our incisions are very small retroperitoneal incisions. I, I happen to do my own incisions there also. Uh, but, you know, we trained in a day where we did all of our own anterior incisions, no matter where it was. Um, so I think if you put the lordosis low, where an ALIF works best, then it allows you to transition through a relatively flat thoracolumbar lumbar junction. If, you, if you're trying to use lateral inner bodies and you're trying to shift the lordosis up to three, four, two, three, one, two, then you don't transition from lordosis to kyphosis. You have to do it very acutely. You don't have a nice long flat segment. I think the French talk about spinal harmony. So, you know, I think when you, when you have a flat back like this, and this is a two level and we use, you can use lateral inner bodies to correct that. And you can, you can correct the lordosis, but if you notice that lordosis is higher than it should be. So if you look carefully at the thoracolumbar junction there, this patient looks okay, but there is no flat area. From about T10 to L1 or two, it should be relatively flat and it's not. It goes from lordosis to kyphosis very quickly. And I think this is a setup for PJK. The other issue is, is lateral inner bodies themselves are not great sagittal plane correctors. They can be, and I think Don showed how to, Dom showed how to do it by getting it in the front, using a 15 degree cage. But 
you know, this is a patient where it, it wasn't done well. They did multiple lateral inner bodies and then they did percutaneous screws in the back and they basically established a nice flat back for this patient. This is not how to do it, okay? So if you're going to do it, you can see in this patient where the loss of lordosis here is mostly mid to upper lumbar, a nice place for lateral inner bodies. If you look at the lateral inner bodies prior to posterior surgery with some pontiosteotomies, the amount of lordosis they achieved in themselves is mediocre at best. But if you do a couple ponties and you close down and compress through those and you lever around those and use them as a center of rotation, then you can establish lordosis to do it well. And the lateral inner body can be a great tool because the fusion rate's high, it gives you anterior support and you lever around it. Now you, you can do that with a T-lift without repositioning the patient but I, I would say that the surface area, the, the lack of subsidence, the fusion rates are more attractive with the lateral inner body. Uh, I'm not a one, one position person for lateral inner body still. I usually reposition, but um, you know, a, a T-lift does allow you to stay out of that position, okay? If you add pontiosteotomies to a T-lift, you can do a lot of correction, okay? I mean, you, you can see here, this is, five, one, four, five, no, no A-lift, pontiosteotomies in the back without being even overly aggressive with a T-lift and you can establish that. So if you have good hard bony end plates and you're not worried about subsidence and you want to stay in the back, um, it can be done. So, you, you know, you don't have to do, you don't feel like you have to do it. For spinal stenosis, um, I, I think it's a great tool for foraminal stenosis. I've not bought into it as a tool for central stenosis. Uh, this is a paper where they try to look at who this can work for and who it can't. Um, and they felt that you can have success even with people that have pretty significant stenosis. Now, I will tell you, there's some examples in this, in this paper where the, the amount of post-op st residual stenosis to me looks not a ton better than it did pre-op, but I'm not sure how much you need to decompress them if you fuse them and create stability, and maybe we only need to get a certain amount of, of decompression. So they felt like they had the most predictive success using a lateral inner body for central stenosis in people with low body mass index. And I'm not sure why that was. If they had a preoperative spondylolisthesis, which makes sense because when you shift the lysthesis, when you do the lateral inner body, it often shifts the, and reduces the lysthesis opening the canal. It folds back in the posterior annulus and the, and the ligamentum flavum. And they thought it was best if there was a lot of disc height collapse, because again, then you're opening up, unfolding the ligament. They felt like their failure rate was higher if they had severe stenosis, but the disc was not severely collapsed. And I, I think that makes sense because then you're not opening anything up indirectly. So I think this makes sense if you're going to go down that road. So kind of in summary, I, I think lateral inner body is an invaluable tool, but it's not the end all be all. I think you, if you recognize its limits and utilize it where it provides the most value, I, I think it's, it's clearly worth having in your, in your armamentarium. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. That was a great talk. Uh, I always find if somebody's given a talk and I agree with most of what they say, it's a great talk. Um, so I just wanna go through a couple of the questions that have come in from the Q&A and then we'll do the uh, um, a couple of cases. Um, one of the, a couple of questions have come up uh, regarding, oh, and John, if you could, uh, yeah. Um, what about um, when can you do standalone and when do you need to go posterior? And if you're going posterior, what are the relative advantages of open versus uh, percutaneous? Dom, you go first. Yeah, so I um, I do uh, posterior fixation when they have a they do not have an intact tension band posteriorly. So somebody with a ismic spondylolisthesis um, or somebody with a significantly mobile slip, uh, where I'm worried about asking, I always think, how much am I going to ask of the cage? right? Like how much am I asking the cage to keep that spine stable? So somebody with a pretty minimal spondy that uh, doesn't move too much between their supine imaging and their upright imaging, I think asking the cage to hold that's reasonable thing to do. Somebody with an ismic spondy that's mobile, 
I think need to be backed up. I open up and do it open posteriorly if I need to access the canal. Um, and I think that uh, uh, percutaneous play screws uh, have obvious advantages when you don't need to access the canal because you don't need to expose the spine. So I just, I decide to do open when I have to, when I have to get into the epidural space. John, anything you want to add? So I, I pretty much agree. You know, I, I rarely do a lateral inner body as a standalone. I, I just, I like backing it up with perk screws. I just don't feel like it's that hard. And I think the strength is much higher, but there are cases where I think the bone's good and I'm really trying to avoid the additional surgery that I think you can do it. For deformity, I'm pretty much always opening the back. I mean, I, I know this concept of put the lateral inner body stand them if it's mild. To me, those are probably so mild of deformities, they shouldn't have been done as deformities. So I'm almost always opening deformities. Um, and so I tend to open, I agree, if I'm opening the canal, usually if I'm going to open the canal, I'm probably doing a T-lift or something anyhow. But if, if I'm doing a lateral inner body, I need to access the canal, I'm opening it. A lot of my lateral inner bodies, say for foraminal stenosis, I'm doing perk screws, I'm not opening that. Um, if I've got an adjacent segment disease that's foraminal stenosis, not central, I might lateral inner body. Um, occasionally on those, I'll do those as a standalone, depending on how hard I think it will be to extend up their instrumentation posteriorly. Uh, so I, I think it has a role. I, I would say it's, it's very limited in my hands because I, I really like the, uh, the strength of having posterior fixation. Yeah, my, my, yeah. my feeling is if, if I can do, if I have to take old, out old hardware, it's obviously going to be open. Um, if, if I can do percutaneous, that's my preference because I think they recover faster. I don't think it makes a big difference in the long term. Um, my deformity patients, I still do all my deformity. Well, almost all my deformity patients open. Every now and then I will do a deformity patient with percutaneous screws and I'll show one in the cases. Um, I'm, I'm not, it, I always have issues with it. Um, okay, uh, another question is um, patients with subsidence and a pseudarthrosis, what's the bailout? Well, the first thing I would say, and I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll use moderator's prerogative here. Generally, what happens is if they subside, they still go on to a fusion, um, and then you're dealing with the if you let them if you let them go long enough. Um, if they subside and, and they have a pseudarthrosis, um, it, you know the, the main thing is getting them solidly fused and, and then figuring out what to do with alignment. Um, there's a question about at L12. Um, how do you understand the renal vasculature? Well, with a true lateral approach, you're going retro renal. It's not a true retroperitoneal approach. It's actually a retro renal or retro gerotis fascia approach, um, just like the, the, the straight lateral. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I think uh, there, there was also no, a question about how to manage. The the, rib, sorry, go ahead, John. If you just take down the 12th rib at L12, if it's in your way, it puts you right in the right place. Yeah. You don't go into the lungs and put you right in the right spot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I take down the rib every time I have to, and uh, yeah. and I try not to get too anterior at one twos. The diaphragm sometimes is in your way. Yeah. But I think that's probably worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, there was a question about managing the the um, how, how do you manage the sacral vessels uh, at L five S one? Do you ligate the, the middle, central middle sacral, sacral artery? Vessels, or? I just dissect them. I used to try to tie them off. I just put a couple clips at the top, couple clips at the bottom, and I cut them. I try not to cauterize too much between the vessels in case I'm, I'm around the sympathetic plexus, but I just clip them and take them down. The center. Some of them sometimes are big. Sometimes you have more than just one vein and artery. So you have to look around and, and look because you know there's nothing like pulling one off the, off the iliac vessel and then having to try to get a stitch in the vessel where you're making more holes than you're sewing. Um, so I, I just take them down and clip them. They're, yeah, they're really. usually not too big of a problem, but look for extra vessels. Sometimes you have more than more than the normal two. Yeah, both, both there and also at four or five. I've seen up to three iliolumbars. Um, yeah, that, that iliolumbar vein, you know, sometimes it's one vein coming off. It's usually one vein coming off but it can start branching very quickly. Yeah. And so sometimes you've got two, three, I've seen the same thing. I'm like, what's going on here? I, I thought I had it and I'm clipping around and yeah, be very careful. The yellow lumbar vein, it's, it's a bit treacherous. Yeah. Okay. 
So I got, I've just picked out a, a three cases just to sort of um, look at things a bit. Uh, hang on here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right. So I had, you know, just sort of wanted to look at a, a couple of different scenarios here and see what what you guys think. And again, we'll see what the audience thinks. So um, first off, this is a 72 year old woman. Um, she is seven years out from an L4 to sacrum uh, anterior interbody fusion with percutaneous screws. She did great for about six years. Um, then she presented complaining of increasing left greater than right leg pain. The leg pain was dominant over the back pain. Here is her imaging, her x-rays, and her MRI. So she's got a degenerative spondylolisthesis with foraminal stenosis and lateral recess stenosis at uh, 3-4. So, John, why don't you go first? So, you know, frankly, this is a good case for lateral inner body. I think you have pretty good, go back a slide, I think you have pretty good lordosis. So I don't think you have to be overly aggressive with lordosis. I would look at the parameters, but the pelvic tilt's pretty normal. So I'm not gonna be trying to get some big lordotic cage here. I'm gonna probably put a seven degree thing and I'll probably go lateral on this. The bony end plates look pretty sclerotic. And so I'd be pretty comfortable. Uh, this might be someone I do a standalone in because the central stenosis isn't bad. All you're trying to do is decrease the foramen. Uh, I think if you want to, if you want to do a lateral inner body and then flip them over, you're going to have to get those, the, take all the screws out. The good news is you're fused. You could just do it through little wiltsy approaches. You could take the screws out percutaneously and just use the screws that you have it, use the screw holes you have at four and put perk screws up at three, four. And you could do that relatively minimally invasive. So I, I would be looking to, this is a good case for lateral inner body. In my hands, quite honestly, I'd probably do a lateral inner body, turn them over, just do wiltsy stabs, take the screws out, and then just utilize the screw holes at four and put new perk screws in at three and lock it in without opening this whole thing because you don't have to open the central canal here. Dom? Yeah, I agree. Well, I, uh, most of it I agree with. So I, I think it's a great idea. I do a lateral. Uh, of course, I do an anterior lateral here. She's got great anatomy for an anterior lateral surgery. Um, I would do this standalone uh, pretty much every time. She's got good sclerosis of her end plates. The only thing I'd say is I, I would try to get her a, a little bit of a lordotic graft here because you can see she's, especially between her supine and, and upright imaging, she's hyperlordosing one, two, and two, three. And she might be doing that in response to the fact that she's collapsed at three, four. So she, it might just save her some of that disc collapse she's got through a thoracal lumbar junction if you get her some more three, four lordosis in particular. But I, I would do this as a standalone. And, and the point I was gonna make earlier, I didn't, is when I say standalone, I mean integrated fixation to the cage. So there'd be screws into the vertebral body, but they'd be vertebral body screws clearly not as good as pedicle screws but also not the same thing as just putting a crazy across with no fixation so that's yeah, what i would do I, here. when i say that same thing I, if i'm going to put in without poster fixation i'm going to use something integrated okay. on the rare occasion i do let me just I sorry i'm just going to look at the yeah the that's other, the only other comment i'd make is you you do have to make some decisions about which side you're coming in on for your lateral inner body given my druthers i come in from the left side with everything being equal, but if my a lift approach was on the left, you know, I've seen that scar kind of extend up. I might go in on the right side, and if you go in on the right, you won't run into much issue. So it may change the side I come in on potentially because, you know, that a lift scar could extend up in there and maybe give you a little bit of trouble. Yeah. So, so my, I, I, I completely agree, but um, there's also, I, for me, if it was me doing the a lift. I'm a little more comfortable coming in from the same side because I know what I do, how much dissection I do proximally. If somebody else has done the a lift, yeah, I'm much more likely to change sides. Okay, so that's what I did. I used, a, a, a like you both suggested, uh, an integral, integral fixation cage. Okay, this is the next one. Um, this one gets into a whole bunch of potential discussions. 
um, because, as you'll see. So this is a 46-year-old woman. She presents complaining of almost exclusively left anterior thigh and lateral calf pain. She's got a little bit of axial back pain, but the back pain is not the dominant. The dominant is her leg symptoms. And here is her films. You can see she has a rotatory subluxation lateral aesthesis at both L3-4 and L4-5. Um, she's maybe, she's pretty good coronally and pretty good sagally in terms of her, uh, her balance. Um, if you look, she's got really severe foraminal stenosis at both three and four. She's got good uh, central canal. Um, so really it's, it's, you know, the, the neurogenic problem is all just foraminal stenosis at three and four. And there's your, your uh, three, three, four on the, on the left, uh, four or five on the right. So Dom, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, Doug, can you go back to her x-rays? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, just put the x-ray up. Yeah. yeah, so um, she got a little lateral, uh, let's see, at 2-3-2, at two, two, huh? A little rotary at 2-3. It's, it's not too bad, actually. Okay. So, I, you know, in my hands, this would not, I mean, it's a nice lateral talk. I, I would not personally opt to do this laterally for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, she doesn't have great anatomy at 4-5 for it. Um, but that's not the main reason. I um, think the lateral surgery is a great, powerful tool, but I do not think it is the best tool in our toolbox for rotatory subluxations. So if I said she's relatively balanced, even though she's got a fairly straight thoracic spine, right? So she's probably compensating through her thoracic spine, but she's relatively balanced and I want to correct a rotary. I want to kind of get her spine back onto itself. I think the facets need to come off and it needs to get rotated over. So I'd probably do a two-level T-lift here. The other option would be, you know, two level A lift. I still don't think she has the best vasculature for it um, because I think you cor correct rotaries. I know Doug, you and I talk about this a lot. You taught me this, um, but for this, it'd be a T lift, two level T lift. John, what do you think? You're muted, John. Yeah, there. yeah. We're, we're which which we're calling point with your arrow. What you're calling four five and three four. Four five, three four. Okay. All right. So this is actually, she actually has an L6. Okay. Um, if right. you really look at this, this is a, this is a hemi, it's a hemi lumbarized S1. Okay. That's, that's what I was wondering. Cause that, that may change it up a little for me. One point I would make that, that I thought of it being this case, if I'm doing foraminal stenosis and, and it's asymmetric collapse, foraminal stenosis, I'm using lateral interbody. I always go in on the side of symptoms no matter which side I'd prefer, because, you know, we very commonly give them a little psoas pain in their other leg with hip flexion, and obviously their plex is more at risk. So I always go in on the symptomatic side, particularly if they have weakness associated, like if they've got some L4 weakness, I'll go in on the symptomatic side. So th this is symptomatic on the left. It's only left, nothing on the right. So, you know, that, that poses a challenge because getting, and if you were considering a lateral inner body, because I think you might be able to do it at three, four. And I, I do agree, rotary subluxation, I'm not sure how well it corrects that. Um, but it would be very hard to go on the symptomatic side of the left at four, five. So if I was doing lateral inner bodies, I'd probably be coming from the right, violating my own rule. Um, I'd probably, I'd probably consider the, the other thing I would say is if I'm coming into the front to do a procedure to correct three, four and four, five here, I'm probably going to correct five, one, because at some point, depending on how old this lady is, I may be coming back to do a greater deformity surgery and I would want the solid base. So I would be leery of coming the anterior. And I like to put an, a, a, a lift at five, one to create that base. So if I was going to come into the front of the spine, however, I did that at three, four and four, five, I'm probably including five, one, because I want to make sure I leave the OR with the base. Then I'm in the middle of middle of this lady's uh, scoliosis. And I'm also violating a rule by stopping at an apex. So I, I'm a little concerned about that. And I, I'm thinking that if I'm doing this patient, I'm probably not doing three, four, and four, five alone. I, I'm probably, if I have to do more than one of those two levels, I'm probably doing her whole deformity. Mm -hmm. If I could do one of those levels and convince myself, for example, it was four, five alone, 
Then I would do a lateral inner body and perk screws there. Okay. Uh, coming in probably from the right. But so, so I, I'm a little concerned about just a two level here, what I'm going to leave her with above that. Yeah, I, I, I that's part of the reason I presented this case. I was hoping we'd get a little bit of this discussion in as well. So, you know, I I agree that, you know, the um, the, the concern if I do end up having to do a major deformity down the line with uh, um, what do you do at 5-1? Um, she had a really, at, at her 5-1, she had a really open corridor. And one of the things I've done in patients who've had a previous ALIF at three at 4-5 or higher um, is if I have to go back at 5-1, I'll go in from the right and I'll do the exposure from the right. So I'm in a fresh retroperitoneum. So I'm not quite as worried about what's going on at 5-1 if their vascular anatomy is good. Um, I completely agree with 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 the, the comment about rotatory subluxations. I've tried reducing the rotatory subluxations with laterals and I've just never had been, I, I can get it to look good coronally, but the rotation is still there. And I think the rotation puts a lot of stress on the levels above and below. So my preference is to try and derotate them. And so what I did with this woman was actually, I did a, a two level a lift and, and perks um, you know, she, her, her, her alignments improved symptomatically. She's only about six months out right now. She's doing great. Um, you know, I, yes, I'm worried. Is she going to collapse above below? Um, but she was young, very active and, and really, you know, we had a long conversation about the relative merits of doing everything or, or the, the smaller procedure. Um, we looked up a bunch of my, um, my patients at eight and 10 years out. Um, and showed that actually only about 30% of them had moved on to further surgeries. I think you have to be, you know, really sit down with these kind of patients for a while and figure out what their problem really is. Yeah. Yep. You know, if there's any component of balance problems, I can't right. stand up straight or right. a significant back pain component. I mean, you know, these are patients that you're doing for their radicular leg yeah. pain. Yeah. And, and but, I think you can have a discussion because you can come back still and do a deformity surgery here yeah. if yeah. you need to. Yeah, that, yeah, th that's a nice thing. This doesn't burn any bridges, particularly, as I say, where she had such a wide corridor at 5-1. Um, it's, you know, I always look at the, 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 the patients with a, with a deformity. Is this a patient who is having pain because of the deformity? Or is this a patient who's having pain because of a degenerative problem who happens to have a deformity? And to me, it all comes down to balance. If they're sagittally and coronally balanced, I'm going to look for a more limited option um, with the, the realization that, yeah, we may be back doing the deformity surgery 5, 10, 15 years down the line. Um, okay. So moving on now. Oh, one question that did come up on the, on the Q&A. Um, in the trans psoas, the, the psoas pain, how long does it last? Four to six weeks. Yeah, I, I tell them. I tell them a couple months. Yeah, I I, I I say eight to ten weeks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So last case. This is a sixty-three-year-old male. He presents complaining of activity-related back pain and bilateral anterior thigh pain. On clinical exam, he is eight centimeters positive sagittal balance. Here are his films, and you can see he's got a relatively flat lumbar spine. He has fairly extensive uh, dish, like the flowing osteophytes all throughout. Um, and, and when you look at his CT, um, you can see basically as you look through all the cuts, he is fused everywhere from T4 to L2 and from L3 to sacrum. And he has one mobile disc. He's got some loss of lordosis. He's got relatively severe lateral recess stenosis, but it doesn't appear bony. I didn't put the axial cuts in. So, so who, who wants I like to this now? case. Sorry? I, I like this case because is, is, is his sagittal plane, is it a complaint of his? Is he here for severe mechanical back pain with, yeah. with, with neurological symptoms related so, to a hypermobile so, segment? Yeah, he's, he's mostly back pain. The anterior thigh pain bothers him but it's mostly the back pain and the fact that if he stands for too long, he fatigues and gets real tired and wants to sit down. 
this is an interesting case. So this is a part, you know, this is a good case for a lateral inner body, not being greedy. Like I would probably try to put a 15 in, but those end plates are not going to be powerful. Like you said, if, if it collapses, they'll still probably fuse. You just lost any correction. So I would not be greedy about getting height back here. I wouldn't be going for, you know, a big tall graph. And then I would perk it in the back, but I would not, I would definitely not stand alone it. I would perk in the back and I would perk it with screws of one, two and three, four. You, you need to get a long lever arm to hold this. I would not, I'd be very leery of just putting perk screws at, at two, three. I would go one, two, three, four and get, get a little longer lever arm like I would for an ankylosing spondylitis fracture. Yeah, I, I, just, I, complete, I completely agree. I was going to make that the same point is that, again, this is not the cage for, not the case for integrated cage. And I would go longer with my perks for sure. Uh, at least two up and two down for him. And, and I agree with you. I, when I look at something like this, I, I, I treat it like a fracture. Yeah. So, so that was, that was kind of my thought. The form thoughts is here. not I mean, the issue now, Doug, because I think if you're really going to correct the form in the hand, it's an osteotomy case probably. So I'm not trying to make his deformity, you know, normal with this. I'm trying to treat his current problem. If he has a deformity issue, we come back and do the deformity surgery because yeah. it's a so different ball game. What, what I looked at this guy is, is uh, uh, he actually had relatively flattened out his thoracic spine. And, you know, if you, if you try to match his lumbar lordosis and his pelvic incidence, yeah, you're going to have to do a deformity operation. But if you really look and you go the old fashioned way, John, you, you'll remember doing this. What we used to do with these patients when we were trying to figure out how much correction to get is we used to cut the film at the level we were trying to get the correction and just bend the film until we got the head over the hips and we measured that angle. And it turns out that to get this guy's head back over his hips, he only needed about 15 degrees. Huh. Um, you wouldn't be matching lordosis, but since he's fused everywhere else, I thought, you know, maybe we can do a little bit of both here. Um, so actually that's what I did. Um, I agree with, with that you need a longer lever arm on somebody like this. Um, so my thought was a lateral inner body with perk screws. And so I used, a, 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 I did a trans psoas here um, with an expandable uh, lordosable cage. And then I went, so that's, or sorry, I didn't use an alertosable cage. I used a fixed cage. That's a 15 degree cage. Um, I think I, I'm more paranoid than you guys. I want even longer lever arms. I went 12 to sacrum on them, um, which, you know, the longer you go, the harder it is to thread the rod. Um, but uh, that, that's what I did on this one. You can't but go me, too long. Let, yeah, so I agree. You can't go too long. Yeah. If you're if you're trying to get his head back over and you want to get everything you can, did you ever consider doing this open in the back and and doing Schwab twos and then still so, doing it? So that that yeah that that was part of the plan is is what I was going to do if I was happy with the alignment I got, I was going to do just the the anterior and the perk screws. If I was unhappy, I was still going to do perk screws and I was just going to do a limited open and take out the facets at that level. Okay, so one question on. Um, the post-operative dysesthesias that you get um, from the laterals, if you've irritated the nerve, how would you manage it? Expectantly. Um, I just, I tell patients, I, even, even though I do everything in front of the show is I tell every single person in their pre-op appointment that they're going to have anterior thigh pain and numbness. And then if they don't have it, they're happy. And if they have it, they expect to have it, um, but it doesn't persist. And I just say, it's going to get better over the course of days to weeks. A little neurotin, maybe if if it's bothering them a lot, maybe a little neurotin, but for the most part, it's observation. Okay, so one one last question here. Um, it was a long construct. Why not go down to the pelvis and avoid the SI joint dysfunction down the road? Um, the the simple answer to that was the CT showed that he'd already fused his SI joints, so I didn't need to worry about the SI joints. I tend to not. If if I don't feel I need to take to extend to the pelvis, if I've got good fixation, I tend not to. But as time has gone on, I've gone to the pelvis more and more. I don't know about you, John, Dom. I, I would not have gone to the pelvis for this, but just because I don't, I don't think it would have been necessary. But I go to the pelvis if I'm correcting sagittal plane, and I'm doing multi levels. I'm I go to the pelvis almost all the time. 
Okay. You know, but but there are problems with it. You know, you get screws that loosen. You know, if you don't fuse the SI joint, you can get screw breakage, screw loosening, you get some pain. And I'm not bought into the fuse all the SI joints you're going to the pelvis on yet, but I'm I'm watching the data. Yeah, I agree. I, I go to the pelvis if I if I need to if I plan on cantilevering through the pelvis. And uh, I would not go and let's say he didn't have this guy didn't have his SI joints fused. I would not go in here just to prevent SI joint dysfunction because truthfully in my head, I, I don't really know what that means yet. I, I agree with you guys is that SI joint dysfunction. I, I don't understand that um, quite yet. I, I haven't really uh, drank that Kool-Aid yet. Okay. Uh, so one question here about uh, rod size that, that here I rods look like five fives. Would you use 625? Actually, that's a 60 rod. Um, so it's halfway between. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, John and Dom. Um, been, been fun talking with you again. Um, I hope uh, to the participants that you've managed to learn something from this. Um, and uh, I think we'll call it a night. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you.